We have discussed several arguments for God, and now we have come to, uh, we have come to the fifth argument, and I think this one will actually trigger most resistance. It is the religious experience argument for the existence of God. Um, a religious experience is when someone feels they have had a direct or personal uh, experience of God. And this argument basically says that if people feel they have experienced God, this will be the most convincing proof of God's existence because they have personally experienced or felt God for themselves. It is not simply an argument based on logic or reason. Um, um, no, it's the, the religious uh, experiment, experience can be a vision or a dream in which God speaks to a person. It can also be a healing like I have experienced when I got healed from, from asthma. It is interesting to know that this argument has been around for a long time already. So how does this argument work anyway? So let me give you a first, a first an outline of the argument. I will do this in four premises. Premise one, there are compelling reasons for considering at least some religious experiences to point at, uh, to and validate spiritual realities that exist in a way that transcends any material manifestations. Premise two, according to materialism, nothing exists in a way that transcends its material manifestation. Premise three, According to classical theism in general, and to many theistic faiths, God endows humans with the ability to have spiritual experiences and to perceive, albeit imperfectly, such spiritual realities. And these spiritual realities exist in a way that transcends any material manifestations. Premise 4. Therefore, to the extent that premise 1 is accepted, theism is more plausible than materialism. Okay, I know, that was a mouthful, so I admit, I, let's see whether we can make this a, a little bit more compact. Um, premise number one, many people of different eras uh, and of a widely different, uh, widely different cultures claim to have had an experience of the divine. Premise number two, it's unconceivable that so many people could have been so utterly wrong about the nature and content of their own experience. Premise. Three, therefore, there exists a defined reality which many people of different eras and of widely different cultures have experienced. Do you see what we've just done? The basic argument form for religious experiment, uh, experience arguments is um, inference to the best explanation. The main attack on this argument has, be, has to be done on the idea that it cannot be true that all the experiences are false. Can it be a true statement? In fact, the biggest question is whether the experience or experiences are theoretical. What's that word, word you ask? Well, a theoretical experience, experience is an experience that goes hand in hand with reality. In other words, it needs to be real. Uh, Theoreticality relates experiences to truth claims. If I take, for example, a few, few ecstasy pills and I start to see flying pink elephants with uh, purple bunnies hanging on their tails, you might safely say that this experience is not veridical. However, if I hear a song from, let's say, UB40, and I tell the person next to me that I believe that to be UB40 with the song There is a Rat in the Kitchen, then that belief is true. So, the experience is theoretical. Uh, Richard Swinburne's uh, principle of uh, credulity is an important key to find out veridicality. What a word, veridicality. This rule says that unless there is um, good evidence to the contrary, if a person seems to experience X, he or she should believe that X probably exists. So, if we have numerous accounts of religious experiences, we should assume that at least some of them are real. Okay, let me explain this with an experience I once had. When I was a teenager, I practiced a sport called BMX, and I was pretty good at it, at least 
Um, I won the Dutch championships uh, one time. Uh, I became second two times and one time third. But then all of a sudden I started to become out of breath real fast. Uh, after a while I couldn't finish um, a, a full track. After quite some medical tests it became clear that I had asthma. Big time. The doctor told me that I had to learn to live with it. A few years later I became, uh, I had become a Christian, got married and mostly lived, uh, lived with a shortage of breath. One day my wife and I were just having some fun, you know, and she ran after me. And I tried to run up the stairs and she followed me. But all of a sudden I couldn't go on. She won while I was almost thinking that I was going to die. Can you imagine how I must have felt? I mean, running with my wife and she actually won. Anyway, I was so upset, so angry and disappointed that that evening when I was alone, I actually screamed at God, more or less blaming him. Why did Jesus heal the blind, uh, the blind, the lame and all those other people? Why couldn't he just do the same to me? As a matter of fact, I had never asked God to heal me. This was the first time. So it was pretty in, inappropriate um, to, to do it like this. Not thinking about my behavior towards the Most High, I just resumed my daily life. I had an appointment with the doctor somewhere in the next month. We were going to do some tests to see whether my medicine was still sufficient and to see whether the asthma got worse or not. So the assistant started to do all these tests and I had to breathe in a mask while I was running. All the while, all my functions had to be monitored. And I remember that I felt unusually well. When the tests were done, I had to wait for the results. After a while, the assistant called me in and he asked me why I thought I had to do these tests. Well, the doctor and I thought it to be a good idea, duh. Now the assistant uh, asked me why, why? And I said, why? Excuse me? Didn't you read my medical report? Hello, knock, knock. Well, of course he did, but he didn't understand any of it. After all, all the tests showed that my lungs were just perfectly healthy. Later, we asked the doctor and he didn't have a clue. He couldn't have, he said it, it couldn't have resolved like that. I mean, so quickly within one month. Barely a month before, I still had a major attack and now even um, though the doctor had uh, the results in his hands, he still advised me to keep on taking medicine. He just couldn't believe it. So what happened? Oh boy, did I feel small. How rude I had been to the Lord. Still, he answered my prayer and he healed me. And with this little voice in my head, you could ask nicely next time, okay? So... May I be so bold to say that I should suppose that I probably have encountered God in this event. Going back to Swinburne's principle of credulity, this principle challenges the skeptical notion that all experiences about God are guilty until proven innocent. You see, normally we resist the idea of being guilty until proven innocent. If every experience had to be checked on the basis of some other experience, we would fall in a bottomless hole of uh, infinite uh, regress. And in the end, no experience would qualify as veridical. So if we have no good argument to dismiss the existence of God, these experiences should be taken as some evidence, at least, for God's existence. I have noticed that many Christians talk about their faith in a rather emotional way. And that sounds a bit unverifiable and even creepy to some. Still, I believe many of these emotional arguments are hiding, are hiding a deep truth. Um, in the Western part of the world, many prefer to be rational about almost everything. People would want you to believe that they always think things through before they decide. But your average salesman can tell you that this is actually not true. Of course, people are easily persuaded by emotional arguments. Except your friend, of course, your neighbor and any other person you talk to. He or she is totally different. Yeah, right. Anyway, many Christians who are being asked about what they believe and why they believe in Jesus will tell about their experiences. The Lord makes them feel good. The Lord healed them. They talk, they talk with the Lord. They have a relationship with him. Um, and when they felt sad, he comforted, uh, comfort, 
uh, them. When they felt uh, were lonely, he was there. And when they were happy, he was happy with them. All about how they feel and many colleagues or friends think to themselves that it would be nice to have this same good feeling. They often say it out loud as well. Boy, it must be so nice to have that good feeling. So what is this feeling anyway? Why do so many people long to have this feeling? And why are many of them not directly convinced by the more logical argument as given by the diehard apologists? So let's see what Blaise Pascal said about it. He said that there was once in man a true happiness, of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there uh, the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object. In other words, by God himself. On which C.S. Lewis said, Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hungry. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. Well, there is such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly desires were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. Now, the critic may say that a yearning doesn't automatically mean that one gets what he is yearning for. Like, it doesn't mean that when someone is feeling hungry, he will definitely find bread to eat. But instead of answering this myself, let's quote C.S. Lewis again. A man's physical hunger does not prove that the man will get any bread. He may die of starvation on a raft in the Atlantic. But surely a man's hunger does prove that he comes from a race which repairs its body by eating and inhabits a world where eatable substances exist. In the same way, though, though I do not believe, I wish I did, that my desires for paradise proves that I shall enjoy it. I think it is it a pretty good indication that such a thing exists and that some men will. A man may love a woman and cannot win her, but it would be very odd if the phenomenon called falling in love occurred in a sexless, sexless world. Some might say that people who practice other religious, uh, religions may have transcended experiences as well. And this seems to be a real party pooper to our argument. However, we see that, for example, Orthodox Islam rejects this idea since Allah cannot be experienced by mortals. A Muslim just needs to believe what the Quran says, period. Likewise, uh, whatever may happen in Eastern religions cannot serve as proof in a worldview in which the highest state of reality is viewed as to be beyond logic and individuality. Even if the ex um, exercises in these religions makes a person feel relaxed, and calm, these effects do nothing to the rationality of a worldview in which the whole human self has to be overruled in favor of a supposed higher state of consciousness. A higher state of consciousness which cannot be described in a coherent manner. Eastern religions were never designed to help humans to flourish. This, of course, in contrary to the teachings of the Bible. The Bible basically states that humans can be restored in their original state. Now, the goal of Eastern uh, religions is to escape the limits of huma humanity so that a person may rise to a state beyond personality, beyond individuality and any uh, relational experience. Clearly, um, the, the religious experience argument cannot be used on its own to prove the existence of the biblical God Yahweh, but what it does, though, is showing that it is not irrational to believe in a theistic worldview. We cannot dismiss these reports of divine encounters as baloney. These encounters, together with the other theistic arguments, give a strong case of the existence of a being who is the creator, the designer, and the, 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 the big lawgiver. In other words, religious experiment, uh, experience 
claims um, need to be checked with other relevant sources of evidence for or against a worldview. The religious experience argument is only a part of the case for, a, uh, for Christian theism. It should, be, it should not be used as the main argument within apologetics. However, the religious experiment, uh, experience argument definitely forms a part of the Christian apologetic narrative. So finally, I would like to take a look at the impact of religious experiment, uh, experiences. You see, even though I already argued that many are persuaded by emotional arguments, I still think it would be good to find a way to determine whether a religious experience is genuine. genuine. But how? Well, I actually believe that when one is touched by the Most High, this ought to have a, at least some effect, some consequences. For my conversion to Christianity, Christianity followed after an experience of which I, well, I will not go into detail, but um, I worked in a bakery and I burned my arm, um, which caused me to realize that I was on the wrong path. Uh, if you are curious about this story, I recommend watching my story in a video, which I shall link in the description of this video. Anyway. Um, reading the Bible, I noticed that when people had an encounter with God, they changed the things they were doing. In theology, we call this transformational experience. We see this, for example, in the Apostle Paul's life when he heard Jesus' voice on his way to Damascus. You can look it up in Acts 22 and 26. After his conversion, Paul often speaks of the power of Christ. He testifies that God, or no, that Jesus, rather Jesus, helped him even during terrible difficulties. We see this in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 1, verse 3 to 11. Grothuis said that typically Christians report a new moral awareness concerning good and evil in themselves and others. A sense of guidance and calling received primarily from the wisdom of the Bible as well as um, through Christian fellowship, personal moral progress, adhering to moral principles and developing pr uh, personal virtues through the agency of the Holy Spirit, and a deep sense of belonging to God through the work of Jesus Christ. He continues, these reports come not only from the Bible, but from Christians around the world for the past 2000 years. This is to be expected if the Christian message is true. While they cannot stand on their own to defend the truth of Christianity, these accounts form a vital part of the confirmation of the Christian message. The witness of um, a transformed life may very significantly affect those close to the one transformed. So, I often talk with people who had an experience, and I frequently, frequently ask them what it did in their lives. And in many cases, unbelievers gained an interest to find out more about God. Christians who had an experience started to have significant changes in their lives, and they mostly gave God the glory for these changes. Still, a little warning uh, has to be given. A life changed for the better after a religious experience is not sufficient is not a sufficient argument for Christianity or the existence of God or the authenticity of the religion religious experience argument other religions uh, no other I need to say other r religious traditions make similar claims about changed lives and it might be just a placebo effect or even due to peer pressure the last thing happens quite often in certain groups where people tend to have a very strong idea on how one should behave. But be that as it may, we can't and we shouldn't dismiss it right away as nonsense when someone says he or she had a supernatural experience. But the transformational effect after such an experience helps a great deal with the acceptance of that event. The Bible gives advice on how to spot whether someone is speaking truly or whether the person is lying or maybe even deceived. For example, the prophet Jeremiah in 20, uh, chapter 28 says this, As for the prophet who prophesies his peace, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. In other words, if someone says to have had a religious experience, it's always, it's always good to listen to their words, um, especially if the person is already a Christian. 
I have heard Christians say that God revealed this or that to to them. And after some more uh, uh, after more asking, uh, it turned out to be something which totally disagreed with God's word. And this can then be dismissed as not genuine. The Holy Spirit will never ever contradict the words of God. So, how strong is the religious experience argument? Well, you see, that depends, as you probably already know this, if you only use this argument to show that there is a transcendent realm, a supernatural world, then the argument is nearly irrefutable and easy to defend. But when you use the argument to try to prove the truth claims of a specific religion, you must come up with a mechanism for determining how to evaluate competing religious experiences. For example, if I say that religious experiences prove that Christianity is the one true faith, because throughout the ages many people have experienced um, that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, then I must show that the experiences of for example, Shiva as God or the Mormons, for example, are false. And this is why I said that it should be used together with other arguments. So even though I grew up in a materialistic school system and I have been taught that everything needs to be proven in the empirical ways, I actually love this argument. It is so logical and straightforward. If you think about the vast numbers of claims and the quality of life of those who've made them, it appears to be very unlikely that they could have been so wrong about uh, their feelings, about their experiences. Especially in the tradition of Christianity, we see so many believers who, after they received a divine experience, displayed so much altruistic behavior. They demonstrated unprecedented goodness, love and beauty, and many of them changed the course of history for the better. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12 verse 1. So anyway, do take a look in the description of this video, you'll find a lot of information there. Whenever I find some interesting links or things, I will link it there. But you can also find ways to support me. I would also like to invite you to my Odyssey channel. Odyssey is a platform which is based on a new protocol called Library. And videos that are uploaded through uh, the Library protocol are censorship free. Unlike YouTube and others. It would be great if you start following me there on Odyssey. I'm almost mostly active on that channel. You may comment of course on my BitChute channel or YouTube. But you most likely won't receive a reply there. You can also start your own channel on Odyssey and if you use my invitation in the description as well, we will both receive some free LBC. So as always, thank you for watching, God bless you and we see each other in the next video. Thank you for watching this video, you can give me a thumbs up if you liked it. You can also subscribe to my channel or even better, follow me on Odyssey. That way you will never miss a new video. You will find all the links in the description below.